Well, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first of a series of two conversations uh, that we are hosting under the broad umbrella question, who are we now? So tonight's and this morning's um, topic, depending on where you are, is beyond colony to cross-cultural learning. And before we begin, I'd like to thank the British Council and the Australian Government through DFAT for sponsoring the event series and also our really wonderful partners, Griffith University and the Australian National University. My name's Natasha Cheecher and I'm the Director of Change Consultancy Capacity Org. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where I am tonight and of the lands on which all participants in this event, the panelists and the audience are located. I'd like to acknowledge all our elders, past, present and emerging, and the great privilege of living and working on the lands that they have cared for for so long. What, uh, as a piece of pure administration, I just advise you that chat is deactivated, but you can use the Q&A function and ask as many questions as possible. Um, and we'll deal with the questions in the last third of the seminar. And I also need to advise you that this event is being recorded. So if you'd prefer not to be voiced and, and identified in chat, then um, you need to know that. Um, I'd also like to introduce and welcome each of the panelists. Firstly, Professor Carolyn Evans, who is Vice Chancellor and President of Griffith University. Secondly, Melissa Lukashenko, award-winning Guri author. Thirdly, Kathy Hunt, who is the executive, executive producer of Women of the World Australia. And lastly, but not least, least, last but not least, Professor Stuart Ward, who is head of the Saxo Institute at the University of Copenhagen. And Carolyn is in Brisbane, Melissa's in Brisbane, Kathy's in Brisbane, and Stuart, of course, is in Copenhagen, but is originally from Brisbane, and I'm the sole Tasmanian sitting in Hobart, Tasmania. So, I'd like to begin by asking Melissa to respond to the questions that we're raising tonight. So we're asking, who are we now? Beyond colony to cross-cultural learning. I'm just wondering what you think about this idea of moving beyond colony and how it's resonating with your own thinking and being at the moment. Yeah, well, we contain multitudes, of course, and that's true of us as individuals, as uh, subcultures, as First Nations and as um, an Australian nation, I think, uh, Natasha. Um, in terms of moving beyond colony, uh, I suppose the, the etymology of colony is something to do with a, a bunch of, it, it started life, the term, as a bunch of retired soldiers congregating in a particular area, which I think seems um, fairly apt when you look at Australia's uh, beginning, modern Australia's beginnings as a penal colony and the, um, you know, the militarisation and over-policing that has been a characteristic of Australia from the get-go of white Australia, modern Australia. Um, in terms of multicultural lessons, uh, I think that's been happening for forever. Uh, and in the modern sense, it's been happening since the first fleet. Uh, in the book that I'm writing at the moment, Eden Glassy, which is a, an historical novel of um, colonial Queensland, for instance, my main characters, some of my main characters who aren't Aboriginal are the Petrie family, who were immigrant Scots. Uh, Andrew Petrie was regarded as the father of Brisbane in that early colonial period. And so it's been very interesting for me doing the research and seeing the transformation of members of the Petrie family from being British, from being um, complete outsiders. And then young Tom Petrie was, was um, almost entirely assimilated into Aboriginal life. He was an initiated man. Uh, and so my book looks at that tension between, uh, or the space rather, uh, which is why I gave it the title Eden Glassy, a title that captures the, an interim period mm -hmm. uh, where what was purely Indigenous had, had been altered, where what, was, what had been British was no longer fully British. 
and a hybrid culture was beginning to emerge for the first time. Now, what I've discovered in the drafting of this novel is uh, uh, the extent to which multiculturalism was real. You know, it, it's, it's all, it has always been real and it has never been the kind of glib um, target that the right likes to treat it as. Um, yeah, you know, the Germans, the, the Hindu presence, the African presence, the Chinese presence, along with First Nations. You know, there were three um, main languages spoken in early Brisbane. There was, in, there was English, there was Yagara, and there was Gaelic. And all of those languages uh, intermingled and mixed and many, many Aboriginal people spoke, um, you know, English, Aboriginal languages, Gaelic. And, and so it was a real melting pot. And so that's nothing new. The question is, where is it going in the current era? I'm really interested in that idea of the waxing and waning of this hybridity um, mm. and also the disruption of the idea that, oh, the British came, there was, you know, when I was at law school, we were taught terra nullius, you know, then this imprint happened and then yeah. multiculturalism was only invented sometime in the 1960s or 70s. So I have got to go to um, Cathy next on this because Cathy and I have started a really interesting conversation about the, the dynamic between our understandings of multiculturalism in Britain and multiculturalism in Australia and what kind of fantasies and um, disruptions lie in, in that idea of multiculturalism. Yeah, it's um, it's fun. So that was fantastic, Melissa. Hearing hearing about that that and, and that interim period, as you call it, it's been an notion. absolute joy to research this book, Kathy. It really has. I've yeah. learned so much, and there's far too many stories to fit in one novel. Because it's because it, because it, it's as soon as you you started talking about that, I was thinking that is, it's 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 almost what what people now people now want and a way forward of thinking about how how the structures could work moving forward because that's i mean I, that's why I, I have real problems of, of i think i have a problem with the title beyond colony so much has to happen um to even begin to think and get get your head around uh from a contemporary australian point of view to think about beyond colony to because there's so many steps that have to be taken that's to right. potentially get there um and the the thing that i mean um, that that story that you've just told melissa is one of the the key issues that i have and obviously the work that we do through wow is about storytelling and it is it's for me the lack of uh, stories so i um Obviously, people can hear by my accent. I, I was, was it what I am a POM. <laughs> I'm an Australian POM. Um, I've been here 25 years, um, and for the last 25 years, have spent time back, moving backwards and forwards between the two countries. But very much, um, I suppose, going to areas to see family and friends uh, and people. Uh, not within Southeast, because you can probably also tell my, by my accent that I come, come, come from North, um, as they would say. So it's, it's a story, those stories, the stories that we don't know about, about each other, or about the notion of even, even using the term British, you know, it's not a term that is used. I mean, you either, you either come from one of the four nations, and even, but even when you come from one of the four nations which you identify with, you would identify with a very specific place within that nation. So, you know, I am from Yorkshire and always will be from Yorkshire. <laughs> it is a very different way of thinking about than is presented in the context of the stories that, that the usual cross-cultural relationships that we have seen and who has participated in those. Because I don't believe, you know, I still see in the UK, when I go back, I mean, for obviously everybody knows the lack of news about anything about Australia in the UK media, but it is still uh, along the sun, sand, sun, sand, sex, surf and shark bite um, uh, way of thinking. And, and from here, that bit, that's the bit that I, I fear always is not really knowing those stories of the diversity of each of those four nations and what they hold now uh, and, and the way they think about themselves. 
it's uh, uh, and I think that's that's a that has to be a starting point as well as the bigger structural issues that have to change certainly within Australia um, about how Australia thinks about itself what we are going to do in relation to um, uh, a true form of self-governance, what we are going to do in relation to the Uluru Statement from the Heart and everything that spins from that. So a long way to go, uh, but there are some, when, when Melissa uses an example like that, there are some fascinating starting points to how we build the new reality. I'm going to have to spin widely and jump to Denmark after that because in some ways if I think about what you just said and what Melissa opened with you know a, pl a place like Scotland was so far back then and now because of COVID a place like Yorkshire is again so far Kathy because we can't actually go there physically. Stuart you left Australia 30 years ago to become an eminent scholar in questions about British Empire. Um, what's your perspective sitting on the other, physically on the other side of the world on this question of where we are in Australia at the moment and where it's all heading? Well, I guess my first response to the question when it was put to us uh, to be part of the, the webinar was, uh, was you know, it's, it's still a very pertinent question. It's still a very, very resonant question, but it's by no means a particularly new question. It's the question that Australians in particular have been asking uh, for generations and, and with a particular urgency uh, from the 50s and, and 60s in particular. But what I think is particularly interesting, given that we're looking at both sides of the equation, the Australian uh, and British perspectives, is the asymmetry in the way the question's been asked and the way the question's been ransacked. So if you think on the Australian, look at the Australian side, you know, particularly from the 1960s, as, as formal empire receded, as the trappings of British and imperial civic cultures receded, Australians you know, collectively began asking themselves the question, okay, who are we? The question of this that we're having uh, this evening. And you saw that in all sorts of ways. An early example was when we flicked, switched from decimal currency to the dollar. You know, what was the dollar to be called? Well, it shouldn't be called the pound because we need to disaggregate. We need to disengage from that. And it was a huge discussion. There was like a hundred different names submitted for what the currency should be called. There was debates uh, that emerged about the flag, what should be on the flag. What should be on, you know, we had the national anthem that was changed in the 1970s. Royal styles and titles were and still are debated, and we had the Order of Australia that came in. All of these things. Then we had the Republican debate in the 1990s. So, in other words, a never-ending seminar that's still with us. It hasn't stopped, and it keeps resurfacing. Uh, all really about, you know, what are the alternatives to uh, to an Australia that's that's somehow embedded in British civic networks and British modes of self understanding. But on the British side, uh, on the other hand, um, the UK has never really had a corresponding dialogue, you know, among themselves about Australia, the relationship with Australia. Never debated widely how much that relationship has changed and what those changes might actually mean. And what that means, among other things, that that's permitted a lot of really quite hackneyed ideas uh, uh, in terms of what Australia is about to persist uh, in Britain. Uh, Cathy made the point that, you know, uh, uh, British is not a term, you know, the, 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 the way in which we understand Britain and Britishness has changed phenomenally. And that's certainly something that maybe Australians haven't entirely come to grips with, but the opposite also applies. And, and what that, that's meant, particularly in the context of, of Brexit and the aftermath of Brexit, all sorts of stuff, of all, all sorts of hackneyed ideas have, have come to the surface and percolated and resonated in ways that are not necessarily forward looking. Isn't that just real politic though, Stuart? Because Australia doesn't loom large in the English or Scottish or perhaps Irish imagination and economically we're um, small fry compared to, you know, what I'll continue to call Britain. And so, you know, the, you've always got to follow the money trail, don't you? And see, you know, of course we're going to be, or Australia rather, is going to be asking these questions and what's, what's in it for Britain to be focusing on Australia? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly not, I'm not sort of waiting for Britain to sort of come alive with a sort of, you know, a perpetual seminar about the you know, what Australia means to Britain. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the last sort of, particularly the last 20 years, the last 10 to 15 years, there has certainly been a, an enormous reckoning with empire in Britain and the imperial legacies. You've seen 
uh, and particularly in more, more recent years, we've seen the whole question of roads must fall has resonated from Cape Town into UK university campuses. We've seen the whole question of the legacies of slavery. We've seen Edward Colston toppled into the River, River Avon. We've had the Windrush scandal in Britain about the rights and entitlements of West Indian immigrants, all, all of which derives from imperial modes of civic culture where there's uncertainty as to how they resonate today. The legacies of colonization in Ireland where Brexit particularly has brought all these questions about uh, the peace process and the troubles have come back to the surface. We've had the debates about apologies for massacres from Amritsar to, to, to wherever else in 2019. You've had the Mau Mau reparations case that's gone all the way to the High Court in Kenya, but not the legacies of colonization in settler colonies like Australia. It just does not figure. So I guess what I'm talking about is not a reckoning that is you know, mono uh, focused on Australia, but the ways in which which the settler colonial context and particularly context like Australia just doesn't figure in that. And I, I wonder whether it might be useful uh, if if uh, if 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 a, a broader conception of what the, what the legacies of empire actually mean in Britain could conceivably include more um, immediately. Uh, I guess, uh, uh, a settler uh, Australian or Indigenous context. You said yourself, Stuart, I think early, earlier on when, when we've been talking that what one of the eventual outcomes potentially is of that in the next few years is what is the future of Britain itself in terms yeah, of the right. nations? Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, Britain is not a term. I've, I've, I've quoted you on that, and I think we're being filmed as well. Certainly as a catch-all, certainly as a meta-category, I think it really is on its last legs uh, historically. Uh, and while we're putting in plugs for forthcoming books, uh, I'm putting out a, a book next year, uh, which is called A World History of the End of Britain. And the idea of, of that is to really look at, 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 at Britishness as a civic idea and how that has come unstuck. Uh, and I guess two things very briefly I'll say about it. One, two claims to originality perhaps is to say, firstly, it's, it's, it's looking at the end of Britain as history. Right? These kinds of books, and there's loads of them, tend to be future, tend to be sort of you know, predictions rather than, rather than historical, whereas, whereas I'm looking at the ways in which uh, Britain as a cohesive entity, as an idea of the people that actually coheres, um, has become hugely contingent and creaky, and, th and that, that already has a history. And secondly, that, that understanding the end of Britain needs a global perspective. It, it is certainly about devolution. It is about, about uh, the, the four nations. It is about the integrity of, of regions. And you, you mentioned in Yorkshire, mm -hmm. Cathy, where I pulled pints, pints back in the 1980s. So I know exactly what, you, what, you, what you're referring to there. But the end of Britain is not just about Britain. It's also about countless other peoples, yeah. polities, civic cultures that once bought in to Britishness as a civic idea that organised uh, a, a sense of the people and the way the individual related to the state. Um, Australia was certainly amongst that and the way in which Australia and Australians have disengaged incompletely, imperfectly, but nevertheless come a long way since the 1950s in terms of those processes of disengagement. I think Britain and certainly the dilemmas about devolutionary pressures and where that's heading I think Britain could learn an awful lot from engaging with processes in places like Australia. Again, not mono-focused on Australia because there's so many other places that need to be incorporated into that story. Well, I want to come back to that because one of the reasons I whacked Beyond Colony into the title for this discussion is the fact that I've felt, particularly sitting in Tasmania, I have to say, that our federation and our sense of what it is has come under really unprecedented strain through COVID. And I felt a little like I'm inhabiting, at times I'm inhabiting one of a rabble of colonies. It's, so there's a weird, te weird sense of time and a lot of assumptions looping back on each other. So I want to come back to that idea of federation later, but I would really like to go to Carolyn because Stuart just um, referenced yeah. toppling roads. And of course you, went to Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. And so I'd really, I'd like to invite you to reflect on that experience and the prism it gave you in terms of understanding how Britain saw itself, how it saw Australia and how it engaged with its former colonies. Yeah, thank you, Natasha. And I think it builds on some of the ideas here. And I, I left Australia somewhere between the time that uh, Stuart left Australia and Cathy came to Australia. So uh, again, a bit over 25 years ago. And in some ways, it was a really odd experience because it's so familiar, even never having been there before. 
it, I was immersed in the literature of, you know, I came up many, many more books by English uh, authors and Irish authors than I had by Australian authors. TV was filled with red double-decker buses and uh, beautiful Oxford colleges where people were murdered in, in surprisingly high numbers. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 Monopoly games, you know, you'd walk down streets in London and think, I own this street. We didn't even have a sort of Australian Monopoly games at the time. So, it yeah. seemed familiar. Uh, and yet, when you actually lived there, one of the interesting things was what had not been represented in all of those cultural forms. So, it was a very white uh, England, which was portrayed uh, in, in movies, in TV, in books. Now, that has changed, I think, you know, the way that um, the, the various uh, regions and countries of the United Kingdom portray themselves in, in both popular and uh, other culture had changed. Uh, and part of it was also about how Australians and, and as Stuart says, others like Australians were perceived. At the time, there was an intensely irritating, uh, it was considered to be quite a progressive movement about what was called the new world. Uh, so if you went into Tesco's, you could find wine you know, bottle from Argentina, from Australia, from New Zealand, and, and maybe from California, under you know, the New World label. Uh, and really one of my more progressive colleagues at the college I was teaching at was saying to me, she was delighted because she just got a, a, a subject finally up about New World literature. Uh, and again, you know, a bit of Patrick White and a little bit of uh, someone from New Zealand, it was, uh, and I was say, what, what is this new world thing? What's new about it? Um, it's just that you guys bumped into it relatively recently. It's it's been around for a very long time. From from another perspective, it's it's actually one of the most ancient cultures. It's geologically ancient, um, but it, in a little bit the same way that the Far East was Far East because it was a long way to the east of of that central point of reference. There was a total confidence about England being. The, the, the centre and the point of reference uh, and engaging in, in perhaps a, a civilised and, and increasingly pleasant way with the rest of the world, but very much on its own terms and from its own uh, self-reference. And I think that that has changed. Um, you know, there was no, when I applied for the roads and got the roads, there was just really no discussion of problematic heritage there. We were still grappling with the fact that women had originally been excluded and uh, you know, that had only changed relatively recently. So that injustice was being looked at and starting to look at some of the racial injustices in the scholarship. But that full history hadn't been engaged with in any way. And I, I think it is fair to say that those things have changed enormously over time and there is a reckoning now. Uh, and the house itself has done an enormous amount of work on cross-cultural understanding and, and the way that it has the convening power to bring together people uh, and, and has been actually quite a strong force in Oxford to bring together people. So a lot has changed in that 30 years. Uh, but I, I was very surprised coming to England that the way it didn't look like it did on the TV, but once I came to Oxford, it did look like it did on the TV. It was very white. Um, it was very posh. Uh, it was you know, still coming to terms with how you tried to attract the occasional kid from um, a... a one of the schools that wasn't just the very traditional schools that sent all of um, the, the sons and daughters of the aristocracy to Oxford in the past. Uh, and the masters and graduate level programs were different and, and in some ways probably drew on the, the broader empire in quite a positive way. Um, so for those of us who are doing graduate study, it was a much more multicultural environment. But when I, once I was sort of teaching both the senior common room and the undergraduate programs were really not like the England that you saw once you travelled even five or ten kilometres outside the town boundary. I think that, because um, I had a really similar experience doing my post, my doctorate at Cambridge, it was a, I went on a big fat scholarship, big fat law scholarship, which attracted white people from Canada, South Africa, New Zealand and Australia. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in Melissa's earlier comment around following the money. Yeah. And the only reason I went to England, so nothing English in me, the only reason I went was because they paid me to go and do my doctorate. And nobody was going to pay me to go to Macedonia or Turkey or Bangkok at that time. So a sort of supplementary question, not just for you, Carolyn, but for everyone is I'm really interested in how the elites in Australia are consolidated around those well-worn paths of which university you might go to or 
which um, employer you might go to if you're going to go abroad to become accomplished. And in a way, Stuart's unusual because he's gone Scandinavian, right? So if you could all answer that, I think that's a really interesting question for Australia because I think, again, it's not just our federation that's under strain at the moment. It's our sense of who our elites are and where they're headed and what kind of values and um, cultural framing they have. So any, anyone, anyone feel free to answer that. Since my name was mentioned, I might just hop in and make the point that I don't think I'm unusual at all these days. That, no, um, no. that uh, okay, I happen to be in Scandinavia via various other stopping posts along the way, and you, you you just bump into Australians everywhere. And and I think that's pertinent to this question because sometimes the way the question about the Australia Britain question is asked, it's sometimes a bit over freighted with expectation. And this again goes back to when the question was first really seriously broached as a problem back in the in the 1960s and beyond that there was a sense in which well britain has, has been all uh, important to australia you know in terms of you know traditions of governance in terms of institutions in terms of education in terms of sport in terms of you know such a formative connection the expectation was that as you move into a post-colonial or decolonized world and we're still moving in that direction we're by no means uh, uh, arrived if ever, if ever that will happen but nevertheless an expectation well if Britain has loomed so large it must continue to do so it must continue to have uh, a, a disproportionate significance and the question has has, has grappled with the the dwindling purchase of, of 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 the relationship I guess in that time and maybe you know we we, we need not think about someone zooming in from Scandinavia has been particularly unusual or particularly unique, so. Melissa, do you want to say something about elites? Yeah, I suppose my immediate reaction, Natasha, is um, that it's very difficult for me to answer that question because I don't belong to an Australian elite class in, except in maybe a tangential sense, you know, I'm part of the, um, uh, what do they call it, the intellectual class, the knowledge class, I suppose, uh, and I'm educated, I've got my education through Griffith, yeah. which I'll forever be grateful for because if I hadn't, you know, I'd still be in Logan City, possibly with half a dozen kids and a huge mortgage. Um, but I, you know, when the, the stuff came out about um, Christian Porter last year and it turned out that he was at this elite boys school in Perth or wherever it was and then was part of this cohort at the Australian debating finals and then all these people went on to be barristers and politicians and stockbrokers and all that sort of thing. That world is, you know, a million miles away even from me and I'm a middle class educated, um, exceptional Aboriginal person. So uh, I don't know very much about that world or the ways in which it links into the UK, Natasha. I, I'm sort of vaguely aware that that's that's one of many points of reference, probably along with Singapore and Hong Kong and yes. Beijing and New York, I, I would imagine. Um, but it's not it's not something I know much about. Well, it's, not. It's, not, it's not my point of reference. Yeah. Melissa's point about following the money earlier, which is, I, I think, a pretty important one, and particularly as things change and break down. Um, I think one of the interesting interventions from the Australian government has been the new Colombo yep. uh, And that mm. plan has really totally disrupted the way students engage with overseas travel. So it, Absolutely, the UK used to be number one, two and three place that students wanted to go on exchange, graduate study, all those sorts of things. And the US was really close second, uh, and particularly as more scholarships came up there. And then people tended to go to the bits of Western Europe that they'd heard about. Uh, but it really has been the case that by creating a pretty well funded scheme so that even students who, you know, we got quite a lot of students at Griffith who wouldn't easily be able to afford to travel overseas, but you know, it is funded at a level that allows for that. You know, we've got so many students going to the Pacific, uh, into Southeast Asia, East Asia, uh, and it, it's really made them think about the world in a different way and in a way that they simply couldn't have done without that funding. So 
it doesn't necessarily change your, your point about elites. I think still when people are thinking about graduate study, they think about it in a particular way. Uh, but it's certainly opening up doors and experiences for people that uh, that it wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the fact that that money was around. Can I, can I jump back to another point that um, Carolyn actually made, uh, Natasha, about, about things having changed, about perceptions having changed? Because, because I, I think it's quite, I think there's a, a between what um, uh, the UK think of think of Australia and the way they I'll, I'll think about Australians and in some senses I see uh, we have situations often where I see that, that there hasn't been much of a change um, and it's almost a, an inbuilt confidence and belief uh, that, that that a particular way of doing things emanating from the UK is the right way of doing things and you will obviously agree with that you in Australia because you speak the same language as us you look more or less the same as us and therefore you must be you must agree with what it is and, and one of the things I've always said to people to 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 people coming out from the UK to to Australia is I always say to them just because um, everybody's speaking English don't think that they mean the same thing and I think there's a really big difference, a big issue about that language issue. I mean, language being the first, the first thing that it, you think about as to what gives you your culture, what ex the expression of your culture through your language. And I think the fact that we are all still predominantly speaking English as that first language um, gives, uh, gives individuals coming that way as well a feeling that therefore things look a little bit same but they sound the same it's the fact they sound the same and they what they're hearing is is what they're thinking it means when often it isn't so we will i find myself in meetings now in 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 london in projects that we're we're involved in with sometimes just a a, a belief that we we will all be thinking the same way as they are and and it is absolutely not the true we are a million so different so different. I mean, you know, with the starting point, and obviously the thing that one of the biggest story gaps that is missing um, for the majority of people in the UK is the understanding of First Nations Australia. And and until we can actually unpick that, I believe, also from the conversation about multicultural Australia into something that gives it its rightful place um, and in its contemporary cultural context as well, uh, there is a long way to go with the understanding. And then the other big thing that um, Melissa, that's been raised there, um, she was talking about class, the class, where class, the ultimate C word, where the, inter, the, inter, the intersection, I mean, obviously we work in the work that we're doing constantly uh, through an intersectional lens, but the lens that we find the hardest sometimes I find the hardest in Australian conversations and, and that doesn't come, uh, come up in a way uh, I, I think that needs to be talked about one when looking at ourselves as Australians is, is the class issue. And I can't talk from an elite perspective like Melissa, obviously, <laughs> never part of, of, never would be part of the Australian elite. Well, see, I think that's why I think class is, is, a, is a great scab to pick in Australia because we've, we've, we're doing we're, pretty, we're actually pretty good at talking about gender, I think, and we're getting better at talking about race, not necessarily terribly much, but, you know, it's moving a lot. But the class thing, because of this myth that we have that we're egalitarian and that we don't have a class system, but Britain does, and never the twain shall meet. So I might, I might pull you back in, Stu, around that because you're in a, in a um, famously egalitarian society relative to many others. What do you think about that class word and the concept of it and how it's changed just even in your adult lifetime, perhaps? Yeah, well, I mean, certainly, you know, um, 
it's one of the great areas of of, of, of mutual uh, misconception between uh, between Australians and you know, Australia and Britain that that uh, that a, a sort of a hackneyed idea that you know in Australia that you know that Britishness is 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 synonymous with the aristocracy or something you know, that 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 persists, but also uh, the, the the myth that of Australia as a class of society also persists. So so uh, in, in in Britain, but but again you know the, these things are changing. You know, when I went first went to Britain in the 1980s, there was, um, you know, you get jokes about being a convict and all that sort of nonsense. I don't think that uh, persists, but certainly that was bound up with an idea that because you were Australian, you were by, by definition sort of lower middle class. Um, so so the, these are these are also areas that have changed, changed also because of the influence of, uh, of uh, you know, global media corporations, particularly the Murdoch empire and what, it, you know, the, 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 the havoc that has wreaked uh, in the United Kingdom and, and elsewhere has you know, woken a lot of people up to uh, to to you know the complexity of, of modern Australia, uh, and not just in in class terms. I have to disclose something to you, Melissa, which is that I, I knew you would. I knew you would. <laughs> which is that I was at the World University Debating Championship um, mm -hmm. in nineteen eighty eight in Sydney as one of the very few women. I was representing ANU. Um, and uh, there's been a lot of there's been a lot of discussion in the media about who what remembers what about that week. Um, I don't remember the prawns. I do remember sitting in Sydney in Hyde Park, which is you know named for Hyde Park in Britain, um, having a really interesting conversation with Scott because I spent my whole week hanging out with Scottish debaters, and um, we were talking about our lives and our ambitions and what we'd like to do. <laughs> And I said, I'd really like to go and do a master's in Britain when I finish my law degree. And he looked at me in absolute horror. And I won't copy the accent, it's a beautiful accent, but he just basically said, that's some weird fantasy from 1955. Why are you wanting to do that? Which led to a really interesting discussion. And I did end up doing that. And it was one of the best things I've done in my life. But so the thing I remember from that particular week is that horrified reaction from this man from Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. So this is what I said. I'd really like us to kind of dive into this idea, this feeling that I have that things are sort of looping back on themselves and maybe it's just the age I'm at, that you look at the past 30 years of where both our nations have gone and both our federations have gone and some things are so different and some things are really similar. So. To me, that dance and that complexity is really quite delightful, which is why I'm delighted that we're all talking about it. So I think I'd like to talk about federation now. And what Can I just jump in? Yeah. Um, yes. This isn't necessarily about federation, but um, you know, I think it's the third law of uh, physics or thermodynamics or something that says for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Yeah. There's a rise in the far right, a really frightening, real, dangerous rise in the far right. And that's happening in Australia, right? An Aboriginal man was knifed to death in suburban Brisbane three or four years ago. And the man um, that knifed him to death had a swastika as his Facebook profile picture, mm. right? And when I publicised that, I received death threats from his neo-Nazi mates. Mm. So, to me, that says that things have changed because there's pushback. And there's pushback not just by the Rupert Murdochs and the Tony Abbotts and the Scott Morrisons of the world, that there's pushback by these very ugly, dangerous, neo-fascist henchmen. Um, so I think Carolyn's right in saying that some things have changed. You know, we're moving towards treaty. We've had the Mabo decision and native title. Things are, things are not as they were but I don't want to leave this conversation and not talk about um, the danger. You know, Trump might have been booted out, but uh, Trumpism is alive and well. And I think it's, it's as dangerous in Australia as it was and is in the States. I don't know what's happening in the UK. And, and, and was and is in the UK. I mean, I was in, I was in, uh, I was in the UK when uh, the MP Joe Cox was killed. Yeah. Just well, before yeah. the just before the Brexit um, vote, and it was one of those moments where you thought, "That's it, everybody is going to come to their senses." 
Mm. Everybody's that that's that, it's just gone so far. That it's, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it did, but uh, but I and, and I do, I do have another issue around that though. Is un, is, is that also, when I saw some of the reporting, uh, getting back to Australia and seeing the reporting, was, you know, how could how could they possibly? How could those people possibly have voted for Brexit? And I thought, well, you know what. You don't know what's happened to some of those communities post 2008 and the GFC. Mm -hmm. um, the change that I have seen in the UK, in parts outside the southeast of the UK. Which um, comes, since, speaks to what Stuart was saying about absolutely. the potential, um, you know, breaking up of Britain right. or whatever you want That's to call right. it. That's things right. fall apart, you know. Yeah. Chamber yeah. told us many decades ago that things fall apart. Yeah. And they fall apart when people don't notice what's going on and do something about it. And that's definitely not happening in Australia. So in a way, to me, this is a story of, if not federation, but of regionalisms as well, because what's happening on the ground in Vulcania mm. now is really different from what's happening on the ground in Bondi. Yeah. Around COVID, around everything, around everything. And so I'm really interested in that shadow side of the, feder of the federal compacts that we all have. And you see it, I mean, you see it in every, every play, every place. So would somebody, perhaps Stu, would you like to jump in there? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, the first thing to say about, you know, federalism in Australia is how little most of the world, uh, including Britain, is even aware of how different the states are, you know, and, and you know, the, you really do have... Yeah, to the extent that the co the colonial state, you know, the British military fiscal state of the 18th century that that spread its tentacles all around the world, including Australia, to the extent that that British civic phys phys military fiscal state continues as a continuity, it's the state governments. That's where the where the you know, where the colonization happened. These were the colonizing peoples and these were the entities, these were the continuities. Federation, uh, the federal government comes later as a, as a huge gap uh, between the foundation of the colonial governments and the, and, and the, and the federation. But there's a, and, and the cultures that grow up around those polities and the, and their distinctiveness, the distinctiveness of them. Uh, and you don't get a lot of awareness of that or recognition uh, of, of that. Uh, and and to the extent that that Australia has you know is experiencing pushback and uh, you know from a from a far right uh, uh, you know, disaffection with with the with the change and dynamism of, of the last decades, you know it's it's possible you know that uh, that the 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 fissures the breaking points will be along those those state government lines with with different states having different you know different political cultures that could. You know, and we've seen in COVID, of course, the way that the, you know that there's been all sorts of you know dis different ideas of how to how to cope with that. But I think that that that's really a superficial example. There could be a much deeper uh, rumbling, uh, and I won't name any names. I won't mention any states, but certainly there are some states in Australia that are more uh, uh, inclined or, or more susceptible to to to, to far right uh, uh, political agendas than others. Um, just a remark as well about since Brexit's been put out there and since we're talking about this, I think we also need to be aware about how the Australia-Britain relationship has been deployed as an asset in Britain uh, in the context of Brexit. And we need to be aware in whose interest these questions are being asked these days. If we're going to have a conversation, we let, by all means, let's have it. But let's also be aware of what hostages to fortune are out there. Uh, not so much in Brexit itself, interestingly. If you look at, at 2016 in the debate, Australia was invisible. Mm -hmm. In the actual Brexit debate, it didn't matter. It wasn't part of the conversation at all. Equally in Australia, uh, you know, Australia, Australian media followed Brexit like it followed any, any other sort of overseas political uh, uh, issue. Unlike when Britain joined the, uh, the then EEC back in the early 70s, when it was a matter of life and death for Australian primary industries if Britain joined this common market or not. What happened uh, within weeks of, uh, of Brexit in June uh, 2016 is that the perpetrators of Brexit needed a narrative. They needed a story. They didn't expect to win themselves. They had a massive what now question mark. And almost instinctively, react reactively, they reached for familiar uh, uh, tropes. And one of those was the Commonwealth and specifically the white Commonwealth and specifically this hackneyed idea of, of Australia as a, as a loyal cousin. And so you've seen, uh, so when I said before, you know, that Britain hasn't had a, 
sustained conversation about how that relationship has changed. It's not that the, you know, there's been no awareness or no register in Britain of the changing relationship. We've just heard uh, both from, 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 from Cathy, we've heard from Carolyn, how, how much change has, has occurred, but somehow these subterranean ideas and assumptions have, been, have remained accessible to certain types of political agendas. And so we've seen, you know, the British Board of Trade decides that it wants to appoint trade ambassadors. And so they choose Tony Abbott from Australia. And then a few weeks ago, they choose Ian Botham. Now, how, how much trade Ian Botham is gonna generate between Australia and Britain? I think there's, a, there's certainly, we, we, we're entitled to be skeptical, but it's not about trade, it's about, what Ian Botham resonates. He also supported Brexit significantly, I think, uh, back in 2016. But he reminds us of Australia in the 1980s. He speaks to a particular demographic, a particular generation, a particular age group, a particular gender, and a particular uh, ethnicity. So uh, the Australia-Britain relationship is, is, is being deployed. It's an asset. It's, it's, it's being argued over for reasons other than, you know, reasons that we, we might think in this conversation are, are intrinsically interesting. I think as Stuart's rightly saying that, that there are echoes for all of this. Uh, the strains on the Federation are nothing new. They, they pre-exist, the, 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 the tensions between the colonies, the process of Federation was highly contested. Uh, and a lot of the same stress marks are still there. Uh, Western Australia only made up its mind at the very, very last moment that it would be coming into the Federation. There were debates about whether Queensland should be separated into three distinct states. You know, far North Queensland still, still thinks of itself as a separate state. Or should it be two? Should it be one? Should it be three? Uh, and the, the racism, uh, the, the, what Melissa rightly describes as the rise at the moment of far-right racism, it, it's nothing new, of course, in Australia. In, in, in a very fractured set of colonies that were coming together, that were divided between different senses of what should go to what to go to the federal government between free traders and protectionists um what was the thing they could unify around was the white australia act yeah, yeah. That, that that was one of that was actually a point of unity um when there was so much disunity about everything else uh, it was one of the easy things that you could do as a new government to try and get credibility and the sort of things that we now talk about with fringe far right uh discourse were in, in a more sort of civilised and polite way, absolutely mainstream, absolutely mainstream at the time that Australia was federating. You know, is it part of the bedrock of federation? Part of the justification for federation was to try and be in a sufficiently strong defence position to be able to defend ourselves against people of other races. And it's easy. Um, Australia's always, modern Australia has always been a white supremacist nation there's there's no doubt about that i think what's new at the moment caroline is the way that um those movements have weaponized mm. social media and the way they uh the success they've had in infiltrating mainstream politics mm. um you know it was um uh matthias corman i think shook the hand of a fringe politician who'd used the word the final solution in the Australian Parliament, you know, and used it as a dog whistle. So it's it's not just some nutter sitting in his basement, you know, in his mother's mm -hmm. basement reading the latest far right um, website. The, the tentacles are very uh, much entangled with the mainstream politics and the um, fundamentalist Christian agenda, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I, I would hate to think that this is just a continuation of good old Aussie racism 101 that's been around, you know, since the year dot. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it need, you know, the things that happened on Capitol Hill, um, was it last year or early this year? I can't even remember. Uh, but the deaths that happened on Capitol Hill, the, the attempted lynchings on Capitol Hill are not just ordinary American racism and I don't think we need, I don't think it's safe to assume that um, we're not in a new era of very organised white supremacy. So Melissa what can we do about that? So the, I mean the second big question I've posed to you all is how can we generate cross-cultural learnings? I mean specifically between the UK and Australia because that's what the theme is tonight but 
I took you to the shadow side of some good stuff. How do we how do we get ourselves onto the sunnier side of that street? Because if you, the more you start drilling down into those wormholes, the more terrifying it can get. What what can we do? And I'm particularly interested as well because, in one way or another, we're all involved. Well, we're involved in culture and education, and we we have a vice chancellor here. How can we expose our young people? to the world and to that relationship in a way that really sets them up to be having a conversation like this in 30 years where they're saying something that's got a whole lot of better stuff in it. Any, any of you? Maybe the Vice-Chancellor because you do have a lot of young people. Are you a custodian of a lot of young people? What, how, how, and they can't go in and out at the moment. How do you feel about that? Yeah, uh, we are and that's a really important responsibility. I. I yeah, I think it is important just to remember universities are not just a place for young people, that particularly. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Uh, yeah. And I say this importantly and meaningfully that it's it's not just a sort of tripod. Yeah. Um, it, it is the case that a lot of our elite universities are largely places for young people and great places, and not, no, no problem with that. Uh, I think one of the things that universities like Griffith can be good at doing, and, and that can be an important and positive part of this. Is bringing people who've had different life experiences, uh, who might have you know, come to university by quite circuitous routes. Some come absolutely at 18, straight out of school, know what they want to do, ready to do it. Uh, but I think if that's the only sort of person that you mix with at university, then you, you're going to have a reiteration of your own ideas. And some of those ideas are young people, a lot of very progressive and interesting young people. Um, but I think one of the things that we can do is try and make sure that people are engaging with people from other countries uh from people but also people from their own country from different backgrounds sometimes we're we, we we're more keen to think about the cultural differences between a student coming from china and a student coming from australia but sometimes the differences between australians can be just as profound and significant and to be able to try and create educational experiences social experience cultural experiences that bring people together in a meaningful way to try and uh, understand one another's life is, is a great opportunity that universities have. Melissa's point about social media is, is both a, it can both be an incredibly positive thing from that point of view. And I do want to say a lot of uh, particularly young folk who felt themselves isolated, um, alone, nobody's like me, have found their, their group on the internet um, or in various forms of social media and engagement. Um, I remember talking to one young student from India who said, you know, I was sure in the village, I knew I was gay, but I, there were probably other gay people, but nobody was going to say that. I wasn't going to say it, but I came onto the internet and I saw Michael Kirby's work um, and he's a law student and the, the young man was a law student, and, you know, by, by looking at this person in another country, that was fantastic. But <laughs> to say that that social media also has a pretty pernicious and toxic effect for some members of our university community and it can be engaged with in a way that's very uh, toxic and alienating and humiliating and sometimes literally deadly uh, and it's an extraordinarily difficult thing for university oh you wanted us to be positive didn't you so i should i should say there's all the good no, stuff we're all yeah, but, but the road for being positive is... But, but you know, it, it's also... Very, yeah. Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's really <coughs> difficult because we're used, when we're thinking about our environments at universities, we're used to thinking about a campus and a group of people physically present and what, you know, you, you can exclude this person or you can, um, you know, protect people in this way or you can control a classroom conversation or whatever it might be. But there's a whole environment in which our students live, both for very good and, and for very ill, that is really almost beyond the capacity of universities to regulate and it throws up i think some enormous challenges for us if i could respond um i think the assumption that a lack of understanding is at the root of neo-fascism or racism is uh incorrect you know, uh, meeting someone with a different accent, a different skin colour, a different life trajectory can be a revelation and should be a revelation. And that's a great thing and can be welcomed. But I think what, if we want to see less alienated people, angry alienated people um, on the right is what we're talking about, but in any sense, 
what we need to do is talk about power. Who has power? Who exercises power? Who has access to power? Universities can open up channels of power to different cohorts. And I'm one of, example of that in a small way. But Natasha, I mean, when you ask me what can we do to stop neo-fascist alienation turning into deadly political violence, what we need to do is revolutionise the structures of democracy in Australia. Mm -hmm. There's a Greens um, member in Brisbane here, Jonathan Street, who actually practices grassroots democracy. He asks his constituents to for guidance, you know, whether they're Greens voters or not, on particular issues. He does that on Facebook, he goes out into the community, he works really hard and has conversations with people, not to glad hand them, but to say, which of these options do you support? How do you feel about this bridge over the river? You know, we need people to actually mm. believe in a democratic process mm. Mm. if we're going to stop alienation. It's as simple as that. No, I can, can I can I jump in there, Natasha? Because that's the one. That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's the one. You know, yeah. one of the biggest differences between the two 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 places that people people don't think about. I don't know is compulsory voting. And the fact that there is compulsory voting in Australia compared to, and it's the one thing that I vote, you know, I, I almost weep when I stand in the line and have my sausage and all the rest of it. And the first few, the first few years I was here to see that number, well, obviously that doesn't really happen anymore because we're all doing it beforehand, et cetera, et cetera. But to see that number of people turn out at a polling station um, on um, on election at time at election times it was so powerful to me, so powerful, and I think that's so 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 absolutely. I think that's that's exactly where we need to go, Melissa. Is the rethinking and and, and reimagining what democracy is about? And obviously, the other the other thing that's happening um, is I mean, Jonathan's uh, one example. I think the other example is obviously uh, what's happening with the independence movement. Um, and the women who've the women who've stood as independents and seeing now that that is that is growing and that is because I think going to become um, a much bigger movement uh, over the next few years. And, I'll give uh, you an example: when I um, had done my degree, I was in Canberra. I'd gotten a bureaucratic job and I was about to leave and run screaming back to Queensland because the world was so alien. But I was in a share house. And I was watching TV in a share house with one of these middle class young white dudes. And he commented on something on the TV. And it was obvious that he knew someone on one of the stories on TV. And I was just agog that he knew anyone on television. That was like unthinkable to me that you could know anyone who was on the TV, you know? And that's, this is in the era before reality TV. And so people who come from that kind of world uh, the, there's such a gulf between who pulls the levers of power and who knows those people and then who's not six degrees of separation but 60 degrees of separation away but are influenced by those decisions every single day. So the alienation isn't because of misunderstanding, it's because of real structural inequalities. And that needs to be addressed. And, you know, for all the joy of the democracy sausage, Kathy, voting for Tweedledum or Tweedledee every two or three years doesn't actually cut it for me. No, no and it's, um, but that's the bit that has to, uh, I think that's where the potential has to change in the context of what dem democracy is and what you're doing. It's still there. Um, and the only way, as you say, in terms of changing that, the situation that is there at the moment in terms of the right, rise of the far, far right has that has got to be one of the starting points. I mean, Stuart, you're a historian, yeah? Yeah. So what's what's a historian think about this? First of all, first, my first thought in relation to what you're saying is, is to say that power is rarely ceded passively, a particularly deeply embedded structural form. Tell me something power. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and what to make of this current moment, uh, there are two ways of looking at it, and I'm not sure which way uh, uh, is the more persuasive, but Natasha wanted the sunny side. The sunny side would be built, built on what you said earlier, which was something along the lines of, there's no clearer gauge of the extent of the magnitude of change and progress than the, the the viciousness of the backlash. That is to say, what we're what we're seeing is in a sense a testimony to a lot of progress. And these 
these are patterns of progress that that relate to Australia and Britain equally, whether it be multiculturalism, gender equality, racial justice, addressing the iniquities of colonialism. You know, you might say that 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 such has been the change, such has been the extraordinary dynamism that that the problems we're we're witnessing, you know, with January sixth and all of its manifestations are essentially like the last gasp or the sort of the, the, the last stand of a, of a white constituency that's seeing its power uh, uh, suddenly and rapidly ceded. That would be the, the sunny side of the equation. The less sunny side would be to say that all that what might go under the label of progress in the last 50 years, uh, whether we are looking in Britain or Australia, has somehow been achieved without challenging the fundamental structures of power. Now, one of the, one of the things we often you know, talk about in history tutorials is how the white Australia policy, the founding instrument of the Federation, as we heard from Carolyn earlier, the, the fundamental rationale behind the Federation, how that was overturned in the space of 10 years from 1965 to 75 without there being a palace revolution. But, you know, it's an extraordinary thing in a way that that could have happened without there, uh, there, there being sort of barbarians at the gates and so forth. But another way of looking at it might be to say that, that the fundamental structures weren't changed, that, that, these, that these changes, that, that, that a new language and, and a new way of talking and having a conversation about equality, about injustice, about inequities and so forth, that the, that the agenda and the conversations change without challenging uh, the fundamental structures. And that what we're seeing now is those structures have, have become aware literally in, in, you know, in the last decade, that there is real power at stake, that there are real privileges that are to be ceded. And that's what we're seeing is, is, is a much more worrying, uh, if you like, uh, uh, a reckoning with, with, with processes that have really only scratched the surface in the last 50 years. Do you see what I'm saying? That, there, mm. that there's, a, there's a sunny side and there's a not so sunny side. And I think we're too in the moment to dis disaggregate the two. I'm going to move to questions in a minute. So I'd encourage anyone who wants to ask one to use the Q&A function. But before that, I want to ask Carolyn about freedom. Where's freedom? Because we've done some very interesting scholarship around all kinds of freedom. Where, where does that sit in this complex matrix of this conversation that we're having between two places that have a long, long relationship and we, I don't think we know where it's necessarily going. Where, where does freedom sit in this? Because it seems that that's thematically coming up in COVID era more than ever. It's a small question to be able to... I know, I know. <laughs> uh, and can, can I just, I just quickly respond to Melissa's point? Please don't hear me as having said, if we, you know, we just have a multicultural picnic, everybody's going to be happy. I absolutely wasn't making that point in terms of the that really alienated group that you're talking about. Uh, I do think it's important to vaccinate, if you like, some of the rest of the population against those influences who are more open to less, um, to, to other forms of engagement. I do also think mass education, we've moved from a system of, of elite university education, uh, really over the lifetime of certain people in, in this conversation to a, a much more, um, broad, broad scale um, access to education. If we're talking about uh, the levers of power, that is one of the levers of power uh, and that's actually making quite a difference. And again, you see a bit of a backlash there from people who say, well, you know, universities shouldn't be for those sort of people. They should only be for these sorts of people. And that's not a real university because it doesn't have the right, right sort of population. Um, but I think that debate actually has been interestingly comprehensively lost. Um, and uh, yeah, I do think that that makes a real difference. My car saw a backlash. I parked my car at Griffith in about 2010 and it had Aboriginal ribbons hanging off the windscreen wiper and it was keyed. I think four panels of the car was, were keyed. So, uh, yeah, yeah. Univers the universities uh, are well in the mix. Oh, absolutely. They're not, they're not some space that's separate from society. In some ways, that's one of the things about moving from elite to mass education is that they become more representative of both the good and the bad of, of society. There's not, it's, they're not some place that none of that exists. Um, it just means that, you know, they, they, that, that, that they're a wider set of power. I mean, when, when I went to Melbourne Law School, which was absolutely one of the elite institutions, you know, my dad left school when he was 15, the people in my family went into trades and things, all, all good 
respectable stuff. Um, you know, if we think we don't have a class system in Australia, you know, w w walking in the door of an institution like that, it was very clear. Everybody else knew each other. Everybody else had dated one another's sisters and got a, it. You know, it wasn't anyone was unpleasant, but it was just very clear who belonged and who didn't. And it was absolutely along class lines. And the fact that there are now more opportunities and different opportunities and more people from that sort of background is different. This is all avoiding your question about freedom, Natasha, which is a very, very complicated question. Um, I. I, I work on both freedom of religion and, and academic freedom and freedom of speech areas, you know, not, not dissimilarly contested in many ways. Mm. Um, I do think it's an important concept. Uh, it's a concept that certainly can be used and has been used by people uh, to claim free, who, who have power to claim an excess of freedom in order to stop the authority and power of others. I do still think that they're important and relevant concepts, and I sometimes worry uh, about some of the, the younger progressive folk that I engage with who very quickly, because they don't like the way in which freedoms have been used, uh, I feel quite comfortable about the restriction of those freedoms. Uh, and I think that's a bit dangerous. Uh, you know, it's funny, they'll be quite rightly very critical of folk like me in, in power, positions of power and authority. Uh, and yet they immediately want us to stop, step in to stop people speaking, to stop uh, people exercising certain rights. And at the level I said, well, you, you better be careful about these structures. Once we tell the government they should be stopping people doing things, once you tell vice chancellors or CEOs or, you know, it's, it's their role to police all of that. You better be pretty sure of what the boundaries are, how those boundaries are constructed, who constructs them, because there's a danger there too. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it's a question for a very long book, not a, a short conversation. Um, but freedom is definitely a double-edged sword in this fight. It was, it was only by exercising, you know, pretty strong and discordant and disruptive forms of, of speech and protest and assembly that as Stuart says, people um, clawed, clawed away the changes in the power that they have now. Um, and I think you just need to be conscious of some of the dangers that, that come with quickly accepting um, that forms of authority should be put in place. Even, uh, even accepting there do need to be some of those because sometimes freedom can be used in a way that's very repressive, uh, from one group can be used in a way that's very repressive of others. Well, and again, if you compared the evolution of jurisprudence around rights in Britain due to the influence of the incorporation of the European Convention of Human Rights, which of course we don't have. That's a whole other topic we could oh, go down. Really, really, fa <laughs> really, fasc really fascinating. So I'll, I'll go to the um, questions now. Um, they're for, all for anonymous attendees. Uh, the first, picking up if I put that, do I put that up there? Does that work? Does that come up on your screen? No. Picking up a bit laterally on Melissa's great point on following the money <clears throat> and Stuart's point about the debate over what Australia's dollar would be called, what's the new currency for cross-cultural exchange? Is it narrative? Is it story? I love that question. The boomerang. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dollar, is it? Or, or is it the current currency of exchange? Well, it can be a tool or it can be a weapon. Okay. And it comes back again and again. Anyway. I'm being flippant. Well, yes and no, Melissa. Mm -hmm. It's a good answer. What well, does anyone else have a view? Maybe you, Kathy, because you deal with story all the time. No, I, I just, um, I, I think that's a brilliant answer. Just a fa fabulous, yeah. fabulous answer. I mean, I, 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 um, I think it's both. Okay, next question. It's back to you, Melissa. Going back to Melissa's research for the book she's working on and the sense of multiculturalism being real in Australia since 1788, can Melissa and the panel talk about the importance of recovering and celebrating the complexity and hybridity of Australia in that 200 odd years and what power that has or doesn't in terms of structural change? So recovering and celebrating our hybridity in that time since. 
it's in both. Can I, just, can I pitch in a subsidiary question? Because the, you know, the key yeah. word or the premise is recovering something that's presumptively lost. Um, you mentioned, <clears throat> Melissa, when you first started talking about the book, that, that, the, that the period was a, as an interim period it was, a, was a term you used. And I wondered why you, what, what you were thinking of in terms of an interim period, because I thought it was really quite intriguing what you were talking about and perhaps was it talking about things that have persisted and, and, are, and are perpetuated and that, 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 uh, that yeah, it's not an interim at all, but perhaps something that has just not been properly conceptualised. Uh, yeah, and this is the point at which I realise that I'm not a historian. I'm a novelist writing about a, a historical era which I've taken an interest in for 20 years and researched for the last two. Um, yeah, it's I'm, I'm keenly aware that I don't have the professional skills to actually um, explain, you know, the the course of history in a way that a professional historian would. All I can do is take um, what I think are some interesting characters and interesting events, such as the hanging of the resistance leader Dunderley um, in front of the townsfolk of Brisbane in 1855 and, and, you know, make narrative around that and have my characters respond to that sort of stuff. Uh, it's it's might sound a little bit um, trite or, or silly to say that multiculturalism has preceded uh, British invasion for a very, very long time. Stuart, you were saying that the states uh, have their own characters and their own trajectories. Um, I think uh, as an Aboriginal person and, and someone in conversation with blackfellas all over the country on a regular basis, the states don't seem very different to us, except that mm. the racism is worse in Western Australia and Queensland, generally speaking. Uh, the white nationalism or the non-Indigenous nationalism is pretty similar wherever we go. Um, before Cook, there was 500 nations and those 500 nations reflected in language and in culture the, the geography of the country, you know. Um, what is it? Geography is destiny. And geography is also culture, very much so for us because land is lands and waters are central to Aboriginal and islander life. Um, so the hybridity has always been there because we are a vast continent, you know, partly desert, partly rainforest, partly cold country, like where Natasha is. Very cold. And all of those things feed into different cultures and different languages and different understandings, although they were all grounded in a very similar Aboriginal law. Uh, what I'm trying to do in the book, when I talked about an interim period, I meant um, I meant a period where Aboriginal people were not yet outnumbered or, or the period during which Aboriginal people became outnumbered in southeast Queensland. So the Yuggera and Yugambeh and other um, nations of southeast Queensland outnumbered Europeans until sometime in the 1850s. And at the point where I start my book, there was only 200, approximately 200 Europeans left in the tiny village that was Brisbane. And so the, the blackfellas at that point saw, had seen the colony come and most of the colony go. And in my imagination, we're thinking, great, they're all going, things are going back to normal. The criminality will be gone. We'll have peace again. We'll have freedom, religious freedom, religious structures. We'll have uh, an, a civilization. And these savages that tie people to trees and flog them will have buggered off where they came from. So the interim period that I'm talking about is uh, it's not pre-colonisation, which is a world I don't feel equipped to portray, and it's not a world where Aboriginal people were missionised, demoralised and a minority. It's, it's a, that period where, at least in their minds, things were going the other way. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, yeah. No. <laughs> Okay, I've got a lighter question. This is a question for Stuart Ward. Is an Australian studies program still available at Copenhagen University? No, and uh, you know, it's actually a question that I can run with in relation to what was being said earlier about uh, university campuses and uh, you know, the, the p political culture of the, of the campus. And um, you know, in getting back to this theme about 
uh, right-wing politics and you know, pushback against you know, various forms of, of, of progressive dynamism and so forth. We have to also bear in mind that it's almost the exact same chronology where we've seen uh, the rise of, of Trumpism and its other manifestations. There's also been a period where we've seen the humanities completely gutted at universities. Now, I have to be a little bit careful when we have a vice chancellor uh, on the on the panel, but uh, but we we and this this applies very very sort of similarly to to Australia and Britain, where there are cross cultural learnings, but perhaps not the kinds of learnings that people in the humanities would like to see. Where we've seen uh, programs cut, where we've seen funding streams uh, turned off, where we've seen also uh, politicians on the right openly identifying humanities programs and humanities academics as some kind of enemy. And I think there's it's no mere coincidence that the very discipline that were arguably at the forefront of a lot of the, the, uh, the, the, the value change and the ways in which, you know, whether we're talking questions of immigration or whether we're talking about questions of, 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 of racial justice or, in, or, or Indigenous rights and so forth. I think there's no mere coincidence that, that in the same chronology, in the same time frame that we've seen humanities programs, not least the Australian Studies program at the University of Copenhagen, uh, taken out of circulation, that, that a lot of other stuff has, has thrived in the vacuum. So let's we'll leave a sunny side of that to another time. Um, this is from the German ambassador to Australia. Where is the non-British immigrants part of Australian society in our debate about de-Britishising Australian society? Right. Front and centre, I would think. Yeah. Why? Why, Melissa? I would. I would hope. Where, why? Why do you say that? Uh, because when I walk out my door, um, I see as many yellow and brown people as I do white people, and you know, no doubt some of them are Brits or, or the children of Brits. But um, you know, the 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 era of Australia being a land of South Sea pommies is well and truly over. Um, you know, just the simple demographics mean that Britain is going to be less and less. Uh, important to Australia, I think, uh, you know, the, the centre of gravity is, uh, has already shifted. I well, think. I've always liked your idea that we all contain multitudes and we revisited that recently in um, the essay that you contributed to the European Exchange, which this conversation bounces off, which is um, issue 69 of Griffith Review. And that's a really great, I'll just plug the book, that's a really great read for people who want to dive in more to how what we're talking about today intersects with bigger stuff about people who are in Australia who aren't from a British background and who are European. So my particular interest in that book was how British and European are often quite lazily conflated. I don't like it. It's unhelpful. We need to unpack everything. Um, and, and then again, the more we unpack, the more we tease out the complexities, the more we understand. So that's a, the containing multitudes idea is definitely something that I think resonates both in Britain and in, and, and in Australia, which is why talking to each other about our different multitudes is a pretty exciting topic. There's a fabulous blog oh, post by Rashida Murphy uh, yes. I don't know if you know Rashida. Um, talking, no, I don't. <clears throat> she's a Western Australian writer of um, Indian background, but um, she's also a novelist. And uh, yeah, she's wrote a fabulous blog post today about growing up in an incredibly um, tolerant and diverse India, where um, there was a, there was friction, but nothing like what. Uh, is seen in India today and, and about the experience of coming to Australia and being expected to be grateful and and in fact being grateful for some things but the, the, all that complexity and uh, I just think you know Rashida is the is the face of the new Australia she's she's from many nations she's living in Australia and she's coping with becoming a, a new newish Australian citizen uh, and all of the, the baggage of empire that um, mainstream Australia has to offer her and writing about it. I just was going to make a remark about the a sort of, I don't know whether it's an irony or it's a certainly a, um, 
um, a distinction between an, an Australian context on the one hand and a, and a UK context on the other. In Australia, I think it's fairly straightforward that you know, with the end of white Australia and accelerating patterns of, of immigration and diversity, the idea of a British Australia just becomes demographically untenable uh, and increasingly difficult to sustain. Uh, but on the other hand, looking at, at, at Britain, there is a sense and there remains a sense, and this is often discussed, uh, you know, a sense in which Britishness is possibly a more inclusive category than its alternatives. And here I'm thinking particularly of Englishness and the widely discussed and debated resurgence of English Englishness in the last uh, two decades, which many argue is one of the major drivers of Brexit. If you look at the de demographic of Brexit, it's very much an English uh, uh, concern. And, uh, and among sort of uh, Indian, West Indian, Pakistani migrant communities, uh, you, know, you, you will encounter at any rate a certain anxiety about the eclipse of Britishness as a viable civic idea, because there would be many, uh, uh, many, many groups in in the UK that might still, to this day, be more comfortable with being Black British rather than being being Black English, or at least you consider the former category more inclusive and more potentially. Uh, um, uh, diverse in its implications than than its alternatives, precisely because of the legacies of empire and because Britishness was for for generations a global civic idea that deployed in all sorts of different ways in different contexts. So that's just a, an example of the differences between the two. Kathy, right. do you want to say something? No, no, I would, I, I would agree. I would agree totally with what Stuart is saying, but I think it does come down to that. Um, <laughs> almost um, we have to talk about England, <laughs> the problem mm -hmm. with England. It is, a, it is very much an English, uh, that national, the, the nationalism and the rise of the far right in that context is, is, is very much an English issue. Um, uh, I am not, uh, and I can't, cannot speak obviously for, for black British people as to whether they, they would think, I mean, I think certainly older, older people would um, because, uh, and that that role and that notion of that bigger it being bigger and we are part of that because we came from those lands and that's what it was about and it was that great civic project as you as you're saying Stuart I am not sure if younger if younger people would 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 feel that in the same way it's also significant that the SNP for, for decades have been pushing back on the suggestion that they are some kind of sort of white nationalist uh, redoubt uh, yeah. in, in the North. They, they used to be branded as Tartan Tories back in the 1960s. And since the 1980s, there's been an awful lot of uh, effort put in uh, north of the border to, to disaggregate the SNP from some idea of, sort of, a, of, a, of, a, of a white William Wallace sort of Scottish mm. uh, 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 core. Uh, and, and just in terms of the, of the rhetoric, you know, in Alex Salmon's day, back when you know when he was uh, not persona non grata, he uh, he changed the rhetoric from the Scottish people to the people of Scotland, and you know, and there was a you know an important distinction between the two. I've just I think, I think that one of the most responding to the question about non-British immigrants by going yes. straight back to talking about Britain again. Yeah. All right. I'll, well, I'll I'll talk about the Balkans if you want, because you know some of you will know my family background is partly Balkan, so I'm really interested in the ideas of federation and everything we're talking about and colonization from a different perspective in the sense that the place where I have the house that I can't go to now for two years um, has 27 different ethnic groups. I don't know, four or five official languages. It's called Vojvodina. It's near Romania and Hungary. And um, they've been subject to waves and waves of colonization, most famously Austro-Hungarian, Ottoman. So I'm really interested in how we stretch apart as well this colonisation question that we do rightly struggle with in terms of the British-Australian relationship and learn from other colonising experiences. So again, that's, I think that's a conversation for another day. But I'm reading a lot at the moment about the Ottomans, for example, and what kind of colonisers they were and what was left after they declined and similarly Austro-Hungary. So there's a big world of colonizing powers out there so that's just something to flag so sorry can i, can I just yes, yes. throw my because i i think Please. what's important Please. one one of the issues we really are, go, are going to have to face quite seriously is the place of chinese australians mm -hmm. when we look at some of the the primary targets at the moment of this right-wing nationalism that melissa is talking about but also much much broader than uh, it, the, the 
sharp increase that we have seen since the start of COVID in Australia of um, targeting, of bullying, of uh, yeah, really quite dreadful behaviour. And we, we see it with respect to our students, we see it with respect to our staff. Uh, and people, and some of them are people who've been here for a short period of time, some are people who've been here for generations, but they're not immediately discounted as being fully and properly Australian, um, that there's that they're, they're Chinese uh, and, and how quickly we have reverted to thinking that way. Uh, and just the way some of the, the structures of government power are being used to encourage that at the moment too. It's, it's, it deeply troubles me. Uh, and there are legitimate concerns and debates to be had about Australia's relationship with China. There are legitimate concerns and debates to be had about the role of the Chinese Communist Party. Don't, don't mistake me for somebody who's over-barracking there. Um, but who gets to be a real Australian and what that looks like? Um, I think we've just seen a really stark example of how quickly, over a fairly short period of time, uh, those issues can become very real for the, the group that the ambassador was talking about, the, um, the Australians from countries other than, uh, than Britain. Yeah, which, which again points to the need for reform of structures. Yeah, you know, exactly. Where is our Bill of Rights? Where is our treaty? Where are the institutions of a robust democracy that allow people to say that, you know, this is how Australia is run and this is your part in running it and this is how you, we tell you unequivocally that you are a citizen with meaning in this place, you and the Chinese person that's moved in next door to you and the Lebanese family on the other side that's been here for three generations and the black fellas over the back and the African Muslim family who live across the road. You know, the, the structures that reassure people that they matter and that they're not simply being lied to by corrupt governments, which is what I see increasingly on my TV at seven o'clock each night. So if we're going to take this as a big shared human project, what's, what is the future for the peoples, what is the shared future for the peoples of the United Kingdom and Australia? Because we, we contain multitudes. I'll ask each of you to suggest one positive change that you would like to see to ensure that that ongoing relationship is as healthy and constructive and difficult and beautiful and full of all the potential that it can have. Um, what's, what's the one thing you would change? I'd have the um, British royal family give all Crown land back to Aboriginal First Nations tomorrow. Thank you. Crown land back. Yep. Anyone else? I would just venture that, you know, if, if the questions to be posed in that way, in terms of our shared legacies and shared uh, uh, um, prospects, that the, the notion of something shared is articulated in terms of something that's problematic, that's something that invokes a, a set of dilemmas and a, 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 and a set of challenges, rather than something vaguely reassuring, something yeah. that's to be nurtured, something that we must hold on to. I think if we could sort of shift the the, the intonation, that, that would be my wish for the for the future. Kind of creative tension, if you like, or disruption, or even smashing mm. bits of it, maybe. Mm. Happy Carolyn. I'd, I'd like to I'd say I'd, I'd like to see something instead of a, a, we've got the British Council. I think we need an Australia Council led by First Nations people who are exporting culture uh, in a different way than we think about the way in which we do some of those partnerships uh, now. Uh, and and that needs to I think that that understanding of how Australia uh, engages internationally, and I'm not just talking about Britain here, obviously, but that broader understanding of the stories uh, and the experience, stories being told, uh, education opportunities being provided, um, experiences uh, being created. I, I just feel that there has to be a, a bigger cultural on, on the front foot with that conversation about about who who we are in the context of Australia. 
in all its in its and in, in its entirety entirety and i'd also say first first nation led as well right um, we, we haven't uh, we haven't got there yet but um i'm just going to say i think we should become a republic uh yes. and have a, a head of state that changes over time and can represent all the many different faces of australia rather than assuming that for 60 years we need the same face of australia that has to be british and, and who can engage as head of state to, to head of state um, in in the fullest possible sense when we have our relationships with the united kingdom thanks so four wonderful answers thank you everybody thanks to our panelists for participating thank you to everybody in the audience the people who asked questions the people who listened the people who are going to watch the recording I'd, and I'd, a particular extra thanks to both griffith university and the australian national university for supporting this and a round of applause virtually online um, to the British Council and Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade for making a plat, building a really, really rich platform. I urge you to look at the rest of the season. They've got some wonderful, wonderful things happening. And I just believe that this kind of initiative is more important than ever while we are so physically far apart and my wish is that we would all be able to get on planes and be in the same rooms with each other very very soon so thank you and good evening good morning and i really look forward to seeing what this conversation leads to next thanks